Thank you. It's my uh, second time here in uh, Agile on the Beach, and last time it was in 2018. And I was uh, with my colleague here, I was talking about the methodology that we are developing, uh, how to organize design and development process. And uh, we call this methodology goal-oriented design. And uh, this time I was asked to come here to present a case study on how we applied this methodology on a uh, quite a challenging and quite interesting project that we were involved in. Uh, so, as uh, it was told, I'm a head of product in DigiCard. Uh, we are a software as a service company and we work with gift cards. So, the uh, project started that uh, uh, when in 2019 we acquired a company in UK that also worked with gift cards. And it was a bit uh, unusual acquisition. Uh, they were the biggest thing, uh, the most uh, interesting thing was that they were bigger than us. The acquired company was bigger than us. Normally it's the other way around, but uh, just before the acquisition, our turnover was around 100,000 uh, euros, and theirs was 30 million euros. So they were 300 times bigger than us from the turnover perspective. Um, uh, another thing that was a bit unusual uh, was that the software systems that were used by this company there were some customers buying gift cards, selling gift cards, hundreds of them. And the software systems that were used for operations of this company were not part of the deal. They were to be switched off short time after the acquisition. So uh, we needed to build a full replacement for this software system right after the acquisition happened. So um, I'm starting to write the list of requirements that we had. We needed to build a full replacement uh, partially using our existing software, partially creating it from scratch, we were smaller than them, so a lot of um, software we needed to build. Um, another requirement was that the customers uh, of the acquired company should not uh, be affected by the change of the systems in a negative way, uh, meaning that uh, the migration to the new system should happen uh, invisibly for them with, uh, without interruptions in the service and with zero additional uh, downtime. There were other competitors that wanted to buy uh, this company, but, and they were bigger than us, they had more uh, software ready, but they could not guarantee no interruption in the service, and we said that we could guarantee that. Probably they were reasonable, and we were brave, and we committed to do this. And, uh, well, contract was ours, and also the work was ours. Another thing, um, there was a date when this the systems were to be switched off, and it was very close. It was uh, within a year, which for the systems of this uh, complexity and uh, size is quite tight. And also this deadline was quite dead. Systems were to be switched off. So we had a tight uh, deadline. And this is not all. Uh, the existing solutions that were used for the operations of this company were far from optimal. They required very much uh, manual work. Uh, individual uh, systems were not integrated with each other. So we could not just copy what was there before. We, could, uh, we had to uh, build something new, something considerably more efficient. So this is the full list of our requirements. And we had a year in front of us. Um, and uh, well, uh, when all this started, I, it was of course very exciting that we bought them. But when we had this uh, stretch of work in front of us, it was a bit overwhelming. And to make things more difficult, it was end of 2019. So uh, very soon we were hit by the pandemics. And the company that we bought was in UK, and we are based in Norway. We planned a lot of collaboration, fly flying over, working with them. It didn't happen. And also during the pandemics, uh, our turnover uh, grew from 30 million to 50 million because it's gift cards and they became very popular during the lockdown and the pandemics. Uh, it was good for the company. It was a bit more complicated for us that had to replace the systems. Still we managed and let me show uh, how we approach this so that we managed and probably it will be some tools that you can also put on your shelf and uh, use it sometime when you need it. So uh, we needed to build a new system that will do everything that the old system did. And uh, it seems to be logical when you begin to uh, think about what you need to build, to try to imagine, try to describe what this new uh, product needs to uh, be, right? 
Well, uh, this is a wrong question. The right question is what this product needs to do. So the core of my approach is uh, I describe products not as set of features it has, uh, but not as parts it consists of, but as a set of tasks that it allows people to do. So uh, in case of our replacement project, what this new product needed to do was exactly what the old product did, right? So it's a full replacement then, um, answer is quite straightforward. So the beginning of the uh, design process was to analyze what the uh, old system did, exist, exist, existing soli solution, what was it uh, doing, or rather what it allowed uh, people uh, to do. So we needed to uh, know the characteristics of the users, who are the people, and uh, what they were doing in the system. I'm using quite a combination of quite known approaches, uh, jobs to be done, and uh, personas. Uh, probably you know, uh, you are familiar with that. And if uh, you are not familiar with them, then uh, it's easy to find online information uh, about them. Uh, I will not go deep into this. We have some time constraints, and it's quite uh, known approaches. Uh, the, uh, uh, what I try to achieve by applying this is to uh, have a description of a list, uh, have a list of people that are using the system, coherently uh, written, and what they are doing as a to-do list. So, list of personas and to-do list for these personas. Now, the important thing, those of you who know uh, uh, personas and um, everything around them uh, probably see this as a quite overwhelming uh, uh, job to start to, to try to describe what everything is happening in the system. Uh, the important thing is that in the first iteration, what is described was described on a very high level. We did not create a full set of personas with dis, uh, dis, um, detailed description of each of them. We did not create a very detailed set of tasks for them. We needed to have a very high level uh, overview of what was happening. So we had two groups of users, uh, customers that were placing the orders and uh, admins that were uh, shipping the orders out. So we had basically two personas and we had a very high level list of tasks for them, like uh, as high level as operations, receive orders, send orders, uh, create customer records, etc. Customers place orders, uh, see order list, etc. So this on this high level. And the, so the result of the analysis was high level to-do list for high level personas. And this is how our system was described for us in the beginning of, the, of, the, of our work. Uh, now, how uh, to approach this shift of the systems? Well, quite straightforward way would be to uh, build something, uh, to build the whole system and then to move the customers over using some period of time. Um, well, we decided not to do, uh, not to do it this way. Uh, it was quite a lot of money that was involved. And if something went wrong when we were moving the systems, financial losses could be quite considerable for us. And also reputational damage can be substantial. And also the uh, time that it would require moving the, the fully moving, uh, complete, uh, complete system will require much more time than we could allow ourselves. Zero, that, uh, zero additional downtime couldn't allow us to go this way. So what we had to do was to do differently. Uh, the decision was to shift the customers to uh, new systems gradually, to build small pieces of the new system and replace them in the existing uh, system uh, so that the customers are starting using it uh, right after these small pieces are built. So what we decided was to, well, change wings on the fly. Um, having selected the approach, we approach it this way, we needed to see out of all this list of uh, things that need to be done, uh, what to begin with, what to start with by, uh, in, uh, what to start with when we are replacing it, which of the tasks in this list. And um, this is also an important thing, what you can start with so that everything works, so that you can gradually replace uh, the whole thing. How do we approach replacing end-to-end -end systems? Let me explain this, let, me, let us look at, the, at this uh, on a um, system that is slightly simpler to understand than our gift cards. Let's look at the train service. 
Eurostar train. The train takes people from Paris to London, or from London to Paris. Uh, there's a ticket service that uh, allows people to buy tickets. There is a security that makes sure that everything is safe. There is a uh, border control that checks documents. There is a catering that allows people to buy some food. So many things that are happening, many activities that are happening in this whole big system. And let's ask us ourselves a question. If we needed to replace all this system, what will we begin with? Should we begin with replacing the security or catering? Probably not. What was this system ba uh, built for? It was not built for, for catering to feed people. It was not built for ticket, uh, tickets to be sold. It was built for taking people from Paris to London. And it is, so there is one activity that is the core, taking people from Paris to London. And it's this core activity that needs to be replaced first, <coughs> and only after that, all supplementary activities. Some of them are just allowing the main one to happen, like ticket system. Some of them are adding value, like catering. It is nice when you're able to buy some food on the journey, but you can just take some sandwiches with you. It's not essential, it's additional. So it, in every system, uh, there is a core one, and there are supplementary ones. And when you are replacing it, it makes sense to start replacing it with the main system. And that's what we did. We looked at our systems and saw which is our core activity. What was the whole system built for? The whole, sy the whole system that we were replacing was built for allowing customers to buy gift cards, to place an order for gift cards and receive them via some uh, way of some delivery, met uh, delivery method, or rather, to be more precise, our core activity had s lots of variations. We had several types of customers that were placing several types of orders for several types of gift cards, and were receiving this for, with uh, s uh, using several delivery types. So we had variations on all this. This was our core flow. It was not straightforward. It was not single not only from London to Paris, but more complex. Uh, did we need to build all these variations at once? We decided not to. We decided to find the uh, one customer type, the easiest for us, easiest for us customer, easiest for us order type, easiest for us gift card type, and easiest delivery method, and allow this customer to place this order type for these gift cards and receive it via this delivery method. It was end-to-end -end process, not let's only build us, uh, something that will allow cust all customer types to place orders. It was one customer, one flow, but end-to-end -end flow. So uh, <clears throat> then we, after having described what we needed, the first release was described. We need to allow this type of customer to place uh, this type of order uh, for this uh, type of gift cards for this type with the, this uh, t delivery method. This was description of the first release. And then we looked, uh, we looked at the list that we had, list of activities that was uh, happening in the system, and picked from this list only those that were needed in order to enable this process to happen. And, uh, so, and then built software for it tested it, and then allowed this customer to start using it. And then set another goal. What do we want to be using the same approach? What do we want to build next? So all releases were described like this. We want to make system allow X to do Y. Let's say we want to allow now another type of customer to place the order of the same time for the same type of gift cards, etc. What we want to allow uh, uh, the same customers that we already have to place order for another type of gift cards. Let's say not digital gift cards, but physical gift cards, paper gift cards, and so on. And uh, then uh, took out of our to-do list the activities that, that are needed only for this additional thing to happen. And again, built the software for it, started using it, and then uh, formulated a new release with yet another type that were, uh, we wanted to enable. So uh, summarizing uh, that uh, how we approached the 
selection of the uh, uh, things that are going into each release, we want to make the system allow X to do Y, and then to auto activities. So this was our approach to what goes in and what goes out. It's allowed us to have a very good framework for deciding what to build. Not to argue about it, but it was quite clear uh, which are the things we need to put in the next release. All right. Uh, so uh, I have covered the initial analysis. I have covered the prioritization. So how did we do the replacement itself? Let's say we have selected the next goal. We want to allow the customers to place orders for physical gift cards, not only digital, but also physical. Uh, and I looked at the activities and I uh, saw that uh, what's needed for the solution, what's needed to, what they need to do. Uh, and as I, as I uh, said before, uh, we had this to-do list described as this persona is doing this. Uh, customers need to, for physical orders, customer need, customers need to be, or operations need to be able to ship physical orders. This was the activity that we are replacing, right? This was the activity, this was the um, bullet point in the to-do list that we were using in the prioritization. It was high level. It was clear enough for us to understand what we are talking about when we are, were prioritizing, but it's definitely not enough when we are building this. We need something more detailed. So we needed to uh, go deeper and uh, analyze what exactly is happening in the current system. So we needed to see what people are doing when they're shipping out physical orders, what exactly they are doing. And when you are asking people what you're doing on a high level, they're able to go to be rather abstract and say, I'm f shipping physical orders. But when you are trying to ask them to go deeper, what people normally do is they are describing very explicit steps. So when we started looking at how they're sending out physical orders, uh, they were saying something like this. I log into this portal and I select this uh, menu item here. I, select, I check all these boxes there. I press print. I go to the printer, etc., etc. This is how they were describing what they're doing and showing, running around the office. So uh, in order to be able to understand what is happening, the first thing that I did, I described the explicit steps, putting them on the timeline one after the other. This was the only way I could document these things at the moment because they were showing me very explicit steps. And like this, I needed to document all unique flows in these activities. Another type of gift cards. I could not exclude some of them. I needed to document all of them. Because when I'm replacing, when I will be building a replacement, when I'll be designing the replacement, I will have to be able to allow people to do the same thing. I will have to make all these processes possible. So I needed to document all of them in order to be able to allow for all of them. And it was possible to, allow, uh, to document them only as explicit steps in the first uh, iteration. But how much do these explicit steps allow us to build a replacement? Will I build the same portal with the same uh, menu items, same, check same checkboxes, etc.? Probably not. I will not be building another portal, too. Uh, most likely, I will uh, build something different. So in order to build something different that will allow them to do the same thing, I need to understand not which buttons they're pressing, not which menu items they're selecting, but uh, what exactly they are trying to achieve. I need to abstract from implementations to tasks. And let me uh, explain this concept of implementations and tasks uh, a bit, a bit uh, deeper. Let's imagine 19th century, a lady goes to her desk, takes out a, a sheet of paper, a quill and an ink jar and writes the following text. Dear so-and-so, I am planning a small birthday reception next Saturday at six in the evening, and I will be honored if you come. Then she folds the letter, calls the servant, hands the letter to the servant. Servant writes to the other part of the city, then writes back and hands the mm, reply to his master. And then she reads, dear so-and-so, I will be happy to come. And our lady understands that, yes, this friend is coming to her party. Now, fast forward some 
uh, years, it is 21st century, a great, a uh, few more greats, a granddaughter of this lady uh, opens, uh, takes your smartphone, opens a messenger, creates a group chat, adds some friends to this group chat, and writes something like, uh, hey guys, uh, let's meet next Saturday at 6, I'm having a birthday party. Taps post, friends get notifications, read it, and then uh, double tap and this lady gets notification herself and sees that, okay, this one is coming. So two very different processes, right? Looks in the first uh, glance, they are really different. These ladies uh, do different things, use different technologies. It takes a different amount of time. Everything is different, right? But if you are abstract from how they're doing things to what they're trying to achieve, we can see that uh, first, they're trying to communicate to their friends that they're having a birthday party, this way or another. And then they're trying to receive a feedback about who is coming. So sitting down at a desk and writing a letter or creating a group chat are implementations. And communicating to friends that I'm having a birthday party is a task. So in order to move forward from, in my analysis, from what was happening in the system, let's say, of people uh, in the activity of sending physical uh, orders, I needed to abstract from the implementations that I saw, implementations that I documented, to the tasks that people needed to do, the task, uh, what they tried to achieve at each step. So looking at this flow, I analyzed it and saw that, well, first that they were trying to uh, select the orders that need to be dispatched. Then they needed to print paperwork and so on. So I substituted these explicit steps with what they're trying to achieve. I rewrote each process so that instead of flow of steps, flow of implementations, it became a flow of tasks that they were trying to accomplish. And I want to point out two characteristics of these descriptions, of these orange boxes. Uh, they are solution agnostic. I'm not mentioning buttons, menu items. I'm not mentioning how people are doing things. I'm writing only what they're trying to achieve. And these uh, task descriptions are user-centered. I'm uh, writing how the user perceives what they're doing. Slightly formalized version of this, but still. So what I, I'm trying to achieve at this stage is to have all the flows that I have written as flows of tasks, not a flow of explicit implementations. And these flows of tasks that are happening within this activity become the foundation of the design process that will happen at the next stage. And it's essential to have these flows. Here's why. First, I understand what is actually going on in the system. Everything that is going on in the system and what exactly it is. Um, also, as I said, it will be a foundation for my further design work and as I will uh, not be um, copying what is happening now, I will not be copying the portals, I will not be copying the buttons, uh, I most likely will suggest different implementation. And in order to suggest different implementation, I need to see what they are trying to achieve. Another reason, uh, in our particular case, we had some uh, software that was already uh, there and we needed to reuse existing solutions. And the, uh, in other cases, it can be that there are third-party uh, ready software that you want to integrate into uh, uh, your solution. And the buttons and checkboxes, interface elements, will be in the existing solution or in a third-party solution, will be different from uh, the ones that you want to replace. And in order to see what you can replace with what, you have to understand what exactly is happening and not what buttons are present in the interface. And there was another way how all this uh, helped us. Um, uh, when you look at these explicit steps, you see two very different flows. And they are really different from each other. You see the, the next one is your, uh, they log in a different portal, export yesterday's orders to Excel, remove orders with failed payment, etc. So it's different from what was happening above. But again, after analysis, I saw that in both cases, they were selecting 
the orders that needed to be dispatched. It was also the same thing that was happening in the second floor, only it was done in a different way. And in both cases, they were printing the paperwork, again, in a different way, but this was the same, the same thing that we were trying to do. And uh, having analyzed this, I saw that actually we had six individual processes, how people were uh, doing these things. And after analysis, after, uh, ex after abstracting from implementations, to tasks, I saw that actually these were, we had also only two flows that are, uh, we were able to build two flows with, one, uh, with different variations instead of six, which was slightly easier for the user eventually and much easier for us. So we were able to merge several flows into one. Uh, so I know what I have to replace. I have a good foundation, now I need to design a new solution. Uh, let me go through the main principles of how we approach this. I manipulated some tasks. I had these flows of tasks, I manipula manipulated some of them. I tried to see if they can be reordered to make users work more efficiently or if some of them can be dropped uh, uh, completely. Uh, initial systems were uh, not integrated with each other. We were building one system, and so uh, we were able sometimes to exclude manual steps and have, have uh, data being uh, automatically transferred and then automatically filled, for example. So uh, it allowed tasks uh, flow to become uh, shorter and uh, simpler. I, uh, but the main, uh, the biggest optimization happens when you suggest a different implementation to what was happening before. It can be different implementations for individual tasks. For example, users need to add a gift card number to uh, some input field. In an existing solution, they were just typing. it. We can uh, uh, offer uh, them scanning. It will be a bit simpler for the users. In our birthday party example, they were, uh, she was using the quill and an ink jar. We could suggest to, uh, to use the ball pen. It would be a small optimization. Another alternative, we can, uh, can substitute several steps. Uh, and with something uh, different, let's say, instead of sending a servant to the other part of the city, I can uh, suggest to use the post. It will be maybe not saving time, it will be saving cost. It will make the solution more available for other types of people who, let's say, don't have servants. And the process will become more optimal from another perspective. Uh, but uh, also we can substitute uh, the full flow or the big parts of the flow. Uh, we can rethink the whole concept, uh, suggest not an evolutionary, but a revolutionary change. And uh, to do this, we have to abstract even more to higher level goals. I need to communicate to my friends that I'm having a birthday party. How can I do this? And then these group chats or any other different solutions can arrive. But uh, we need to understand uh, is which level of change we are ready to suggest, whether it's evolution or revolution. Uh, it depends on the amount of time that you have, uh, that you're ready to invest, how much uh, if you want to substitute everything or just small things. But it will also allow us to, uh, it has to, uh, the change in the circumstances has to allow this. It would not help to suggest group chats in the 19th century. They didn't have phones, they didn't have chats, they didn't have this concept at all. So at that time, only small evolutionary change would be helpful. But when the circumstances have changed so much, then the revolutionary change is possible. So one of the main considerations for a suggestion, bigger or smaller changes, is uh, how much the circumstances have changed or how much the circumstances can be changed in the, uh, compared to what was before. And also the size of the proposed uh, change is important. Uh, quite often, though not always, uh, uh, the bigger change requires bigger time, a uh, bigger amount of time. And uh, if you have it or if you ha don't have it, also depends on that. Mm. And uh, when we were suggesting new solutions, new implementations, the approach is obviously always look for the minimum or rather two minimums. Uh, we have a minimum for least uh, possible work for the user but also the least possible development. As with the example of gift card number, you can type it or you can scan it. Typing is easier to implement. Scanning is easier for the user. We had tight, tight deadlines, so we were uh, mostly uh, pre um, preferring the optimization for the development, but 
if you are designing with a vision of what will be the easiest for the user, you can you include it into your design. Then when next time when you can, can come back and round some corners in this solution, then you are able to also include, let's say, scanning or some other thing that is more easy for the user. So design for future, but suggest a shorter implementation for the present. This is what uh, was the approach that we were using. In the first iteration, easy approach, easy uh, development, further down the line, easier uh, work for the user. Uh, as many designers do, I suggest the implementation is the flow of screens, right? Flow of uh, designs. But uh, the important thing for me is that it's low fidelity sketches. Here's why. So it's not uh, beautiful and finished. Well, it's not very beautiful on this projector, but still. Uh, very beautiful uh, wireframes, but uh, it, it has to be visible that the button is a button and the form is a form, but not more refined than that. Here's why. Low fidelity sketches allow us to concentrate on what matters. I don't want to discuss the colors. I don't want to discuss fonts or preference, visual preferences of the stakeholders. I want to concentrate on what's important on this stage. Also, I don't want to mislead people by creating the false impression of how well I have thought things through. If I'm presenting fully polished, uh, polished and finished uh, mock-ups, it can imply that my thinking around them is also polished and finished. And at this stage, it's not. And uh, also, rough sketches encourage people to give honest feedback. It is obvious that it didn't take a lot of time for me to draw them, and I can redraw them maybe several times. And people will not hesitate to tell me that you are wrong here and you have to do it all over again. And I want to encourage them to do so. I want to encourage them to criticize. I want discussion and not admiration at this stage. I don't want to sell my design. And uh, so discussion is what I want to have, and discussion is what we do. Another thing that uh, when design is proposed design is finished, we need to discuss it with the team and it's vital to have right people included in the discussion. Uh, in principle, there has to be product side. Often, when in this project, it was me who was representing product side. In other projects, there is a product owner and I work as a product designer. And in general, there can be some other people that are uh, responsible for the product and who are able to take product decisions. So in these discussions, there has to be someone who can make a decision, yes, we're doing it this way or not. It's not for internal discussions, when, uh, for discussion with those who make decisions. The key people that I need here is technical side. Uh, technical architect or developers representing each platform or all of them. Uh, it is essential for me to have an opinion of people who, are, uh, who can give answers about how difficult it is to implement this or another, to suggest a different uh, solution and to say how, uh, how can optimize the solution to make it easier for development without much uh, sacrifice for the user experience. And very often they know solutions that designers are not aware of. So technical people are always part of this discussion. And also we need to have domain and user side uh, it's important to have uh, someone who is very deep in the domain to see if what we are suggesting rings true from their uh, perspective. And uh, it's, when possible, it's good to have users on this uh, level already, because then it will be kind of user testing on very low fidelity sketches, uh, giving, getting their feedback. In the case of this replacement project, it was very easy because I just could have some operations in and there were direct users of the system who could give the feedback, and they were also the main expert in that particular area. So from this perspective, our task was easier, but uh, this is the principle that I'm talking about, and this is the uh, principle that is written here. So this is uh, about the participants, and what we do, we validate our vision. If what I'm suggesting is uh, true from product perspective, doable from technical perspective, and correct from the domain perspective. <coughs> Uh, we correct these flows of sketches. Almost never I go out with, uh, of these discussions with unchanged sketches. I always change something, sometimes quite, com quite considerably. Uh, because we listen to other opinions and we uh, see where things are 
not optimal, where things can be made better or easier and make corrections. But the most important thing that happens during these sessions is that we get a shared understanding of what we are actually doing. Before this uh, joint walkthrough, each of us has their own vision of what we are doing and our own perspective. We are talking about the same thing, but we are thinking differently. By walking through the explicitly shown steps, we kind of put our visions on the table and see how they differ. Oi, we differ. We correct our visions and then we have real shared understanding of it all. So uh, after these discussions, uh, the ob obviously it's an iterative process, I go back and correct my sketches and so on. And until the uh, flow, we all agree on the flow, then we work in parallel like many teams do, designers do this, uh, refine designs, developers start their work and it continues like this until the, uh, this uh, particular piece is built and then we uh, can, uh, repeat it all over again. So summarizing what I have talked about now, I want to go back to the goals that we had in the beginning and see how this approach helped us to achieve them. So we needed to build a full replacement and we uh, built a full complete end-to-end -end replacement. And the description of what needed to be done as a flow of tasks, complete flow of tasks, helped me to be sure in that. There's a uh, few nightmares uh, that are more scary for design is that when somebody comes and, oh, by the way, we also need to do this when the solution is already there. And having a full description of needed tasks and compare this a full description of tasks with what my solution was doing. I was able to be sure that this, oh, by the way, will not happen. So I was sure that if the process starts and ends where the, or the, my flow of tasks started and ended, if all the steps are there, then I have a complete solution without holes and an end-to-end -end one. And we were safe to replace it in the, for, the, for the users, for the customers regardless of the fact that it looked differently. It, had very, it, it was one solution instead of several. It had very different screens, very different interface, very different interaction. We were able to always go back to the tasks and be sure that yes, it actually is a full replacement. Uh, having decided to start and, uh, with a core and doing this gradual replacement, we were able to achieve uh, zero downtime. Not only because of that, but this also contributed to this goal. Uh, we were able to meet tight deadlines because we were able to design the minimum. But we were also able to meet tight deadlines because we were uh, able not to allow this minimum to grow. Again, many of us have seen this. Somebody comes with a great idea that they absolutely want to have in the first release. And if we don't have a good way to say no, it's very difficult to say no. If we have a list of activities that need to be replaced and you come with a great idea, we can see if your great idea is mandatory to complete this task, to do this activity. If not, they have a very good reason to say no, no matter how loud you are. Uh, so we were able to protect MVP from growth and to protect the deadlines to be shifted and we were able to meet these uh, deadlines. And yes, the uh, eventual product was considerably more efficient because we were trying to just allow people to do what they need to do, not looking at what was there before and not copying anything. And we're able to uh, optimize the solution. And yes, the existing solution is much more optimal than uh, the one that we saw now almost three years ago. And uh, so, yes, we did it. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take questions if you have them. Have two disparate systems, one set of orders in, new version A, and all the other 
existing business in B? Was there was there a, was there a management information discrepancy in terms of? Uh, I probably need to repeat it for the recording, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so uh, from what I understood that uh, you are asking how uh, we were trying to replicate the flow in the new solution while there was another one, a sim similar flow in the old solution. So the flow that we were building for the new one, we put customers, some customers, only in the new one. So when we replace this one type of order for one type of customer, etc., this customer was working only with a new flow. So for him, for that company, for that customer, the old one didn't exist. Right? So they were ordering this type of gift cards. So this flow, it was API ordering, and they were ordering other types of gift cards to the old one. So we did not. So that's why it was end to end. Right, but, but if, we, if we, it was a smaller subset, they didn't get to see the big portfolio. They only saw the smaller bit of portfolio. I believe your comments are not uh, heard on the recording. Yes, they did not have a. They did not have the whole piece. They had only this flow replaced for them, and uh, thereby they were using the complete end to end flow in the new solution and complete end to end flow in the, the old solution for other type of orders or other type of activities. Uh, you, uh, I have to repeat. Uh, so how did we select the easy uh, version of uh, type of card, type of customer, type of order? Easy for us. So, but, but easy, easy in terms of complexity? Uh, easy, easy for us to replace. If we are able to replace, the, if it's from the amount of work that we need to put in in order to replace this particular flow. So some type of physical gift cards are more difficult than digital. Digital gift card, you just send it out. Physical gift card, you have to do a lot of manual work in order to send it out. Then you need a lot of interfaces for sending it out. Then you need to build more. So we selected something that is easiest. But not so complex, basically. Yes, for us. Yeah, great. Uh, that is all we have time for for questions. So again, thank you so much for your time, Tatiana. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.